what we're going to do now for the rest of this semester is go through the protocol, the TCP IP protocol architecture. So in the previous topic, we introduced this five layer stack. From the bottom, physical layer, data link layer, network, transport, application. So for the rest of the semester, we're going to go through technologies, concepts, and protocols in each of those layers, working from the bottom and finishing at the top at the end of the semester. So now we're going to start at the physical layer. And recall the physical layer, the goal is to take some data, let's say bits, and transmit as some signal across a link. So for my laptop to send data to another PC that's connected, it needs to send some signal, some uh, physical signal. So this topic on data transmission, we're going to look at the structure and the design of such communication signals. And we'll look at some of the mathematics of the signals and how that's used and eventually arrive at how uh, the signals impact upon some, some of our performance metrics. But first, some simple terminology. And this is easy. We have, in the simple case, if we have two devices, we have a transmitting device and a receiving device. The transmitting device wants to send data to the receiving device. And they send data via some medium. And the communication, what do they send? Well, the physical thing that they send is waveforms, electromagnetic energy. Think of some waves. Okay, light, we can think of as a, a set of light waves. Energy is being transferred from the light to your eye, eyes. My Wi-Fi signal is some energy is being transferred from my laptop up to the access point. So our basic communications is via sending electromagnetic waves from transmitter to the receiver. We need to look at the structure of those waves. Well, what, what are they? What do they look like? And how do we design those waves, or more, more generally, the signals that we send? We want to communicate data, usually zeros and ones, files, images, emails. But what do we actually send from one computer to another is some form of energy in the form of waves, okay? our signals. All right, before we get into the structure of these uh, signals, the medium between transmitter and receiver, we can categorize generally as to either guided or unguided. A guided medium is wires, cables. The signal is transmitted across wires, maybe with some coding around those wires. So an, an electrical signal across some copper wires. Uh, I don't have the LAN cable, but the LAN cable that I plug from laptop into PC in, inside that LAN cable are just some copper wires. And my LAN device generates some electrical signal that is transmitted across those copper wires. And we'd say that's a guided medium in that the signal is guided along those wires across the, the physical uh, material. So other, there are different types of technologies which we'll cover in the next topic. What is twisted pair? What is coaxial cable, optical fiber? But these are all examples of guided media. The energy from that signal is contained more or less inside the, the wiring or the cabling. Then the alternative is unguided, which is wireless communications or wireless signals, a wireless medium, air, water, if we send signals through water, in theory through a vacuum. In that case, the signals that we send are not guided by some material. They disperse almost in any direction. Sometimes we can focus them a, a bit, but the energy is transmitted out of my antenna in my laptop. My laptop has an antenna built into the back of the screen. It generates some electromagnetic waveform and some energy disperses. In fact, it goes in all directions, up, down, left, right. Some of the energy goes to the antenna on the access point up there, which receives it. Wireless is unguided, an unguided medium in that the, the signals are not guided by a particular material. They can go almost anywhere. So we can distinguish. And we will look at them. They have many different properties or characteristics. So wired is good for some things. Wireless is good for other things. We'll look at them 
uh, in the next topic. The link between transmitter and receiver, whether it's guided or unguided, we can say the configuration can be either point to point or point to multi point or simply multi point. A multi-point medium or configuration or a point-to-point -point configuration. Point-to-point -point is then there's just two devices. Transmitter sends to one receiver. Multi-point is when there are more than two devices sharing that link or sharing that medium. So, for example, one transmitter transmits, many receivers receive at the same time. That would be multi-point configuration. So, a different classification. And in any communications link or medium, we can distinguish based upon the direction of communications. We can say a link is simplex, half duplex, or full duplex. In simplex, we send our information in one direction only. An example, TV broadcast. There's a TV station, they have a tower, maybe via satellite even, but they transmit their TV signal your TV at home maybe has an antenna that receives that signal. Your TV does not send anything back to the TV station. That is simplex communications because the data is only going in one direction, from TV station to you. It never goes back. So that's an example of a simplex communication system. Full duplex, when we have a communications link where we can send data in both directions at the same time. So. We have a link, A can send data to B, and at the same time, B can also be sending data to A. Half duplex is, they can send in both directions, but only one at a time, one direction at a time. A can send data to B, or B can send data to A, but they cannot be sending data in both directions at the same time. That's half duplex. An example is, uh, the walkie-talkie, the handheld radios, you press the button to talk, you talk, and that sends a signal to the, the receiver, and then you let go, and then they talk. Okay, You take in turns. That's half duplex. And there are many examples of full, full duplex. For telephone, for example, both people can talk and send data at the same time in that case. So some different terminology and classification of uh, communication links or mediums. I always ask my students, what is this lecture? When I'm talking to you, assuming I don't have a microphone, to keep it simple, assuming the microphone's off, are we using a guided or unguided medium in this lecture? It's unguided, okay? It's wireless, it's air, if we, have the, if we ignore the microphone. In fact, if you consider the microphone, part of it's guided in that the signal goes down the cable and then goes to the receiver here and then goes through wires up to the speakers. Maybe that makes it more complex. But if there's no microphone, what's the configuration? Point to point or multi point? Hands up for point to point. You've got two choices. I eventually want to see everyone's hand. Hands up for point to point configuration. This lecture. Hands up for multi point. Okay, simple. One, when I'm talking at least, I'm transmitting and there are multiple receivers. We've got a medium where I'm communicating to more than one at the same time. What's the desired direction of communication in this lecture? Hands up for simplex. Anyone? Hands up for half duplex. One. What about full duplex? Unfortunately, it is full duplex sometimes, which means I'm talking and you're talking at the same time. It should not be. It should be half duplex. When I'm talking, you're not talking, or when you're asking a question, I'm listening. So ideally, we can communicate in both directions, but only one at a time. Now. We don't want it to be simplex because I'd like you to ask some questions and we don't want it to be full duplex because you'll interfere with me. Okay. So we can categorize links. And we have a question uh, for some 
Okay, the, the telephone, in some, app, some uses of the telephone, the, the data transfer we think is simplex. That is, if you use a, a recorded announcement, you can, you can hear the time. You can dial a number and some computer will tell you the current time or the weather. Okay, that, the telephone system itself, the communication system, would consider full duplex. You can send data both directions at the same time. But some uses of it, may only send in one direction. So we'd say that uh, the telephone system is full duplex. Maybe that application in, of the use of it is in one direction only. Okay? But the, the communication system supports full duplex. Anything that supports full duplex can, of course, allow communications in just one direction. It can be turned into simplex or even half duplex but we'd consider the telephone line full duplex. So, the transmitter generates some signals, some electromagnetic signals to send across a medium to the receiver. What are these signals? That's the main focus of this course, or the first part. Well, the signals, the physical signals that are sent represent the data that we want to communicate from source to destination. And a good example of data is you think of uh, a file and think of it as a sequence of bits, zeros and ones. So to send a zero and one or zeros and ones between computers, we can generate some, some signal, think of some waveform, to represent that data. What we're going to show today is that all communication signals that we deal with we can look at them as made up of many component, simpler signals. We take a simple signal like a sine waveform and another sine and we can combine them together to create more complex signals, the things that we actually transmit between transmitter and receiver. So we're going to analyse and, and look at the different, uh, the basics of signals and then how we combine them together. We can view signals from two different perspective, perspectives, two different time, two different domains. We can call the time domain and frequency domain. Maybe at the end of the lecture today, we'll introduce the frequency domain. Time domain, well, let's look at a simple, well, actually, I'm ahead. First, some simple concepts that you probably already know. We can differentiate between analog and digital waveforms or signals where analog continuously varying over time just a digital signal we think it maintains some level and instantaneously changes to some other level some fixed level discrete changes uh, one characteristic of signals is that they can be either periodic in that they repeat or aperiodic. There's no repetition over some time frame. These two are examples of periodic signals okay, that they are repeating. Here's an example of an aperiodic signal. We don't see any repetitions here. It's continuously changing. In fact, just some, some terminology at this stage. The simplest signal that we will often deal with is a sine wave. Think of a, a, a sine, you know the shape, and uh, if we can think of sending a signal uh, as a sine wave, we can use that to represent data that we want to communicate. And we'll see that the more complex, the realistic signals, we can view as just a combination of different sine waves. So the sine wave is very important because uh, even in theory a square wave like this, this discrete uh, digital signal, in theory we can create this at the transmitter by combining many different sine functions together. 
the sign you know is this shape by adding together many different uh, sinusoids we can in fact create a, a digital signal we'll see that today so by combining signs together we can create different shaped signals that we need for our communication systems therefore we need to remember the characteristics of a sine wave everyone remembers this this equation seen it before you remember the sine function okay and the shape that you get when you plot it against time so this is a simple signal the signal s as a function of time so we're dealing with a time domain and the signal think of the s is the the height of the signal if we plot it the amplitude the general form is that we get some multiplier times sine of some value. You take a sine of some value and you get some uh, result. Where this is a function of time, so S is a function of time, here's T here. There is three parameters to this equation and to this signal. The peak amplitude, A, that's the multiplier. So as we change the value of uppercase A, if we plot a sine wave, if we increase A, we'll see the height increases. We'll see some examples soon. So changing the peak amplitude, of course, changes the height of the sine wave. Sine of 2 times pi, which is constant, times by F, multiplied by the current time plus phi. F is the frequency of our sine wave and phi is the phase of the sine wave. Frequency is easy to visualize. I think you can understand that if we have a sine wave of some frequency, if we increase the frequency, then visually it, it oscillates more often in a period of time. Changing f, well f is the frequency of this sine wave. Increasing it, of course, we get the different shape as the output. The phase is a bit harder to visualize for some people. It's the shift of the sine wave relative to some position. There are some slides here that illustrate that different sine waves. Very simple. I would do it on, on a computer uh, on, on the screen and generate them using some software. Just to show if we create a signal using a, the sine function and these three parameters, by changing those three parameters, we change the shape. Very easy. Uh, I've got some mathematics software called Octave here that will produce a plot of the sine wave. I'm going to plot it over a period of one second from zero up to one. Okay, so I've got some data. T, I've created it before, you can't see it, but I've got T, the data, which is the time, and I'm going to plot a sine function as the time varies. And we'll do different plots to uh, to show the impact of the different parameters. I have to remember how to do it. We want to plot on the x-axis the time, t. You don't need to write this down. I, uh, you, you can see it later. Focus on the plots. And consider the general sine function. A, or the sine signal a times sine 2 pi ft plus phi so i'm going to set values of a f and the phase and we'll see how that plots uh, a i'll set the amplitude to one okay so one times sine of two times pi times the frequency Let's choose a frequency, okay, easy, a frequency of 1 times t, and then plus some phase, and to start, simple, a phase of 0. So this is going to plot, I've already defined the time, it goes from 0 to 1 before, so plot from 0 to 1, a sine function with an amplitude, a peak amplitude of 1, a frequency of 1, and a phase of 0 and make a line which is blue in this case. 
and I made an error. Why? That should be a comma, not a full stop there. Sorry. OK, easy, sine wave. Peak amplitude goes up to 1, down to minus 1. In one second, there is one cycle, which means the frequency is 1 hertz. Recall, frequency is measured in hertz. The number of cycles or repetitions per second. Let's change and draw a red plot, and let's change the frequency to 2. So now it's the same peak amplitude, 1 sine 2 pi times 2 t plus 0. Simply now the same height, but two repetitions in one second. We'd say the frequency of this signal is 2 hertz. We can change the amplitude to 1.5 and let's change also the frequency at the same time so we can change both parameters. So the green one, the peak amplitude is 1.5 so you see it's higher and, and goes down to minus 1.5 compared to the other two and I've set the frequency to be 3 hertz. Within one second we'll see three repetitions of that sine, uh, sine wave. Any questions about sign? Easy. This is uh, stuff from many years ago. Change the amplitude or the peak amplitude, the frequency, which I think you can visualize e easily. What about the phase, this third parameter? Uh, I'll show you the change of the phase. We'll start again. I just have to set up my plot and we'll draw different. In this first case, the phase is this additional component here, plus zero. The phase is zero in this case. Let's change the phase. The phase is measured in radians. Okay, so remember, 2 pi radians is 360 degrees. It takes input as radians here. So let's try some different values and see what, how that changes the shape. Instead of plus zero, I'll add plus pi on four, one quarter of a pi. So I'll set the phase to be pi divided by four. See what we get. Same shape, but it effectively shifts the sine wave along. You can imagine that you take this and you shift it this far. How far? Well, by pi on 4 radians. Okay. So that's what the phase does. It, it produces a, a shift in time. And we can try different phases. Pi on 2. Three quarters pi. And simply pi. So I just shifted, you know, added a phase shift in those different cases, and we can see the, the sine wave is moving along. Um, where the phase of pi, we see it's in fact opposite, upside down compared to the phase of zero. Phase of zero is the blue one. We go up and then down. A phase of pi, cyan is the color here, we go down and then up. It was just flipped in that case. A phase of two pi would be the same as a phase of zero in this case. So by varying these three parameters we can get different shaped sine waves and we can use them to represent data. Uh, what have we got on the slides? There are some other parameters related to the peak amplitude, frequency and phase, the period and the wavelength. And period is the inverse of the frequency. 
a frequency of 2 hertz means a period of half a second, 1 divided by 2. So frequency is the number of repetitions per second, the period is the, the duration in time of a repetition or a cycle. So the period of a, a signal is the inverse of the frequency. The wavelength is the distance in meters occupied by a repetition or a cycle. Calculated, lambda is the speed of light divided by the frequency. I don't have an example here. So if you have a frequency of uh, 2 hertz, and we have the speed of light of 300 million meters per second, then divide that by 2 and we get 150 million meters in that case. So that's the wavelength of that signal. So the, the base parameters, peak amplitude, frequency, phase, from the frequency we can in fact determine the period and wavelength. Now, real communication signals we can think of as being co created by combining multiple sine waves. Not just one sine wave, but for example, add two sine waves together. And if you add two sine waves together, we'll see that you can get different shape signals. We'll, we'll generate this on the computer in the moment, but one sine wave with per one set of parameters of peak amplitude, frequency and phase, a second sine wave with a different set of parameters, then add them together and the resulting shape is this one. And real communication signals we can think of as just being a combination of many sine waves. before we add some together and look at the um, look at them all right now I think the signal that we send from one computer to another across a cable imagine that sig signal is just a, a sine wave how can we use that sine wave to represent data to represent bits for example I want to send some bits from one computer to another. The signal I have is a, I can generate a sine wave of some shape. How could I use a, sine, a sinusoid signal to represent zeros and ones, bits? Any ideas? Okay, when, so the sine wave, uh, where's our example? this one, what we could say is say there's a mapping between the amplitude of the sine wave and the, the bits. For example, when the signal is high, positive, it reaches plus one, let's say that means we're transmitting a bit one. And when the signal is low, say minus one, let's say that means we're transmitting a bit zero. So that's a very simple scheme to say the data we want to get between computers is zeros and ones, some sequence of bits. But what we actually send is some signals. And the simplest signal here is a sine wave. So we could use this sine wave to represent bits. We need to define a scheme that maps each bit to some structure of that sine wave. Uh, Where's my pen? Quick example. Let's, let's use this same scheme that when, when we want to send a bit 1, we'll send, let's say, this portion of the sine wave. And when we want to send a bit 0, we'll send sort of the negative part of the sine wave. So if we have some data Let's say that some random data we want to send. This sequence of bits. 
my computer wants to send that to the destination, first bit, second bit, and so on, well, what would our signal look like? Well, for each bit, we generate a sine wave for some period of time. And again, that needs to be defined, but for our, our case, let's say for bit zero, let's break this up into chunks, even time periods. Using our scheme for bit zero, so we send uh, uh, the low portion of the sine wave. Our signal would look like this. Now we want to transmit a bit one. So let's send a high portion. But then we have a, another bit one to send. So generate a signal. So the hardware, the, the transmitting device, generates a signal of this shape. And then another bit one. And then a bit zero. One and zero, zero. So with some random data, with this very basic scheme, this is an example of the output signal that we generate at the transmitter. That signal passes through the medium to the receiver. What the receiver does is it checks the receive signal. OK, it receives some signal for a period of time. Is it negative? If it's negative, yes, it's negative, that means we must have received a zero from the receiver's perspective. If they measure the, the signal to be positive, then it must have meant that a bit one was transmitted. One, one, zero. That's from the receiver's perspective. Assuming they know the scheme that the transmitter used, they can, from that signal, get the bits which were transmitted. Now, we'll see in practice later that it, there are more complex schemes than, than this. And in fact, the shape of the signal that represents the bits is important. One more example on top of that. Another example, well, here I use this, just the sine wave as the signal. And I really change the phase, depending upon the bit. Remember, the phase changes the position. So uh, normally, a sine wave goes up. Here, it goes down first, so a phase of pi. But I change a characteristic, the sine wave, to represent the different bits. We don't have to use a sine wave. We can use more complex signals. Uh, one of them may be this. A square wave. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, that's another signal that represents the same sequence of bits where we have a negative for some period of time for bit zero, positive for bit one. To transmit the same data, we can use different types of signals or different shaped signals. Which one's better? Anyone want to have a guess? Well, what's some advantages and disadvantages of the red one, the square signal, and the, just the sign based signal, the black one? The the digital one, the, the square one, why would that be better? Because it's all it wants to know, we just want to know whether it's zero or one. So that's much clearer than the uh, curve ground. Yes, it, uh, it closer matches the, what we're trying to communicate to the other side. It's hard to explain, but uh, and we'll, we'll cover it in another lecture with some more detailed examples, but you can think, okay, zero. For this period of time, the signal is always low, meaning always means zero, bit zero. Uh, whereas within the sine wave, in fact, for this period of time, 
where we want to transmit a bit zero, the signal is, well, it's small here, that is minus 0 0.1, and then it eventually gets to minus 1, but then for some period of time it's, <coughs> it's not as low as minus 1 all the time. The result is that, yes, the red one better matches the data that we want to transmit. And <coughs> the practical result is that in real life, when we transmit this signal, across the medium there may be errors, interference and noise, which means what's received is not exactly as what was transmitted. And it turns out that when you have noise, the, the red one will be more likely that the receiver can still decode the same sequence of bits. With the black one, it's more likely that with noise, the receiver will make some mistakes and think, OK, and it's hard to draw here. If this was the transmitted signal, but the received signal was with some noise was like this, because there's some random noise in there, then the receiver may measure the value here and sees, on average, the value is not positive. It is, in fact, negative. And therefore, think a zero was received. As one was transmitted, but because of noise, a zero was received. That's an error, and that's bad for our communications. It turns out that using the square wave, we're more or less likely to have those errors than is if you use just the sine wave. Because it's always minus one, it's always plus one. With a sine wave, it's only at some instant minus one, and only at this point plus one. So in practice, the square wave is better than the sine wave. We'll see some more examples of that uh, later. Uh, all right, now considering that, if we'd like to get the, the square wave to get better quality transmissions, less errors, if we start with a sine wave, well, how can we generate a square wave? In fact, in theory, by adding many sine waves together, you can generate a square wave. Let's try that. Okay. So now if we remember that the square wave is better in this case, it will produce less errors. If we start with a sine wave, how can we get closer to that square wave? I'll try and plot some different uh, cases. Clear our plot and set the axis. Uh, let's plot the simple sine wave. We're, for this example, we're going to remove the phase. We don't, we're going to set the phase to zero in all cases. I'm going to, all right, we'll start with an amplitude of 1 and 2 pi, and let's set the frequency to do something different. I'll remove the phase, we don't care about that at this example. Let's set the frequency to 2. So the equation, if you want to write that down, is S of t, the signal, is 1 times sine 2 pi times 2t. So according to the general equation, a sine 2 pi ft, A, the, the peak amplitude is 1, the frequency f is 2. So it's in fact sine 4 pi t. Okay, so we plot that. Now let's plot a different <coughs> signal which is the summation of two sinusoids. So I'll add onto that another sinusoid which has a different amplitude, in this case one-third sine 2 pi, and we'll see a pattern soon. Instead of a frequency of 2, so the first component, the first sinusoid had an amplitude of 1 and a frequency of 2, 
The second component has an amplitude of one third, and let's give it a frequency of 6 T. Let's make it red. The red one there. So this the red signal is some signal which has two sinusoids added together. So by adding them together, we get a different shape. We see we see uh, what these two humps at, the, at each point here. Uh, what's the period of the red signal? So let's say the blue one is S1 of T. And that was 1 times sine 4 pi t. Why 4? Because it's 2 times pi times 2. The red signal is, let's say, S2 of t. The second signal is sine 4 pi t the first one, plus one-third sine, what have we got? 2 times 6, 12 pi t. 2 times 6 here. From looking at the plot, what's the period of the red signal? The, the plot goes from 0 up to 1 second. What's the period of the red signal? It's 0 0.5. That is, remember, the period is the, the duration of one repetition. If we look closer, it starts here, and then at this point, then it's back to the start again. So the duration of one repetition is, if we look here, is 0 0.5 seconds. The period, uppercase T, is half a second. The frequency is the inverse of the period, is 2 hertz. And again, we see that in the plot. In one second, there are two repetitions, meaning 2 hertz. And if we check for the first signal, we'll see that they are the same. The period and the frequency match that of the second signal. Why? Well, the way I structure that second signal, that we'll see later that that would be always true. Uh, why did I choose one third here and twelve here, or two times pi times six? Well, I know uh, that using that combination we can get a particular shaped signal. Let's do another one in a moment, but record. What's the frequency of the first component in signal two? If we separate the two sinusoids, what's the frequency of this component? Hmm? Same, okay, 2 hertz. So let's say for this signal, F, the first component, see we have two components here. F1 is 2 hertz. Why? Sine 4 pi t, the general form is sine 2 pi f t. Therefore f must be 2. 2 times pi times 2 is 4 pi t. What's the peak amplitude of the first component? 1. Okay, I haven't written a 1, but it's 1 here. What's the phase of the first component? Plus, there's no additive component here, it's 0. In all of the components, I've omitted the phase, it's 0. Now, let's look at the second component. Frequency, F2. Frequency of this component. not 12. Remember the general form is 2 pi ft. We have 12 pi t, therefore f must be 6 hertz. And in fact, when I entered it into the computer, I entered 2 times pi times 6. 6 is the frequency of the second component. 
and the amplitude, the peak amplitude of component 2 is one third. And the phase is also zero. And we get this shape of similar in that, okay, it's high, close to plus one here, and then close to minus one. But of course, it's closer more times to, to say, plus one than the blue curve. Is it the square wave? Well, no. It's not a square wave, of course. Let's add a third signal with a third component. Make it green. So I'll take the other two components and add another one. And we'll see some pattern. One-fifth sine 2 times pi times... Any guess? Anyone see the pattern yet? Peak amplitude 1, frequency of 2. Peak amplitude of 1 third, 1 divided by 3. Frequency of 2 times 3, 6. Next component, to create a pattern that I want to achieve, 1 fifth peak amplitude, frequency is 5 times Two, that is ten. Yeah. You'll see why I'm choosing these values shortly. Times t, there's no phase. Did I do it correct. The green one. We see now it has multiple humps, three humps here. I will not write it down, but. As an equation, it's the same as these two plus one-fifth sine, uh, what have we got? 20 pi t. 2 times pi, sorry, uh, uh, 2 times pi times 10, 20 pi t. And if we looked at the components, the first component is the same, the second component, the third component has a frequency of 10 hertz and a peak amplitude of one-fifth. One more. Add a fourth component. So I'm just generating different signals and we'll analyze and compare them shortly. And we'll follow this pattern of now one seventh times sine two times pi times. 14 T. Why? Well, we see the pattern. One third, one fifth, one seventh. Two times three times five times seven. Two times seven, 14. The frequency of this component is 14 hertz. And let's plot that one. And it's harder to see, but I think if you look close, you'll see the magenta one, the purple uh, one more pumps here. It's getting closer to our square wave. Okay. By adding more components, the, the resulting signal is in fact getting closer to our desirable square wave. Desirable in that it's uh, less impact of errors. It's more accurate. In fact, I, I will not type it, in, type it in, but I'll copy one from before. Uh, let's see if it's correct. I've got one before where I've added many components. I typed it in. I will not try. OK. Uh, let's try again. You cannot read it here, because I had to copy and paste a lot. But I had up to, I think, 2 times pi times 2 by 59. So we had. 3, 5, 7, and then I added 9, 11, 13, and I went all the way up to 59 because I got tired of typing. 
and we get the black one. And we see, well, it's getting much closer now to our square wave. We see the shape, it's going up, and there's this bit of oscillation, and then it's almost flat, and then oscillation, and so on. Keep adding components. So I went up to 59. Keep adding more and more. If you go up to infinity, all right, if you keep going, then, eventually, then you get, in theory, the square wave. Okay? So here's an example. By combining different sinusoids together, we can get different shape signals. Uh, now, let's compare them, some of those signals, and see what are the advantages or disadvantages. Of course, we could use that signal, the black one, to, to transmit our sequence of bits. We, of course, have to change the phase. When we transmit a zero, we need it to be low. A one, we need it to be high. And it would look almost like the red square wave, except some small oscillations at the, the ends of each bit. Go back to our lectures. And let's summarize some things that we're, we're showing in those examples. Communication signals are composed of many component sinusoid signals at different frequencies. That's what we've seen here. When a real communication sy signal we can think of as the combination of many sine waves. And the example equation here has two components. Uh, or we can generalize it, the structure, as sine 2 pi ft plus a third sine 2 pi 3 ft plus one fifth sine 2 pi 5 ft. And that was the example I was showing on the, on the plots. When all frequency components, so this one has two components, the one on the board, two components, if we add a third one, we have three components. When all com frequency components of the signal are integer multiples of one frequency, that one is called the, the fundamental frequency. What do we mean by that? Come back to our red S2. We had two components. F1, frequency of 2 hertz. F2 frequency of 6 hertz. 2 hertz is in fact 1 times 2 hertz. 6 hertz is 3 times 2 hertz. So both components have frequencies which are integer multiples 1 times 2, 3 times 2 of one of those frequencies of 2 hertz. So we'd say for this signal the fundamental frequency, F subscript F, is 2 hertz. That is the frequency of the first component. So that's called the fundamental frequency. The others are harmonic frequencies. So in this one we just had two components, the fundamental frequency 2 hertz and one harmonic at 6 hertz. If we added a third component, I think from memory we had 2 hertz, 6 hertz, and 10 hertz. 5 times 2. So we would have had one fundamental frequency of 2 hertz and two harmonics in that case. If we have that condition, then the resulting signal, when we add them all together and get the end output signal, has a period equal to that of the fundamental frequency component, or has a frequency equal to the fundamental frequency. So in S2 of T we determine the fundamental frequency to be 2 Hz because this component was 2 Hz, this was 3 times 2 Hz. They're both multiples of one of them. The resulting signal has also, so if we say that the frequency of this signal when we add them together, is also 2 hertz. It's the same as the fundamental frequency. Uh, 
you may see that a little bit in this picture. Don't worry too much about the scale, but we have one component with a frequency uh, in this period it repeats twice, a second component with three times the frequency. If you check visually, you see this repeats three times for this every once. So this component is three times the frequency of that. When we add these two together, we get this. And this resulting signal has the same frequency as the fundamental frequency, the first component. You see that this period and this period are the same. And that's why I was using that pattern of uh, combining the components in the way I did. It meets that condition. Why are we talking about signals? Because all the data we send is actually sent as signals across some link. And the people who design the links, design the transmitters and receivers, and build the hardware, they must design the signals to be transmitted. In practice, we want signals that send us send data quickly, a high data rate, but we want to do it as cheaply as possible. Cheap is measured in different ways, less complex hardware, therefore cheaper to buy hardware, um, and also cheap in terms of, we'll see shortly, spectrum and bandwidth. And also, we'd like to have signals where they, I would say, are more accurate. Less chance of errors. And without spending too much time today with an example, we can say that the square wave is more accurate than just the sine wave. We'll give a detailed example of that in the next lecture. But there's two different signals carrying the same data. We can say one is more accurate less chance of errors than another. So the people who design signals must design them to be accurate, fast, but cheap. And there are different trade-offs to consider. everything we've looked at so far is in what's called the, the time domain. Look at all our plots. We show the signal magnitude, the amplitude, as a function of time. So this is time increasing. This is the signal amplitude on this axis. That's in the time domain. It turns out to make it easier for the designers of signals and for the analysis of signals, the people generally don't think about it from the time domain but from the frequency domain. Let's explain that. And we'll start by explaining with an example. Uh, we will do it, we will draw a picture. Consider red signal here, S2. We've got the equation for the signal. We determine there are two components, F1 and F2. Frequency of first component, 2 hertz, peak amplitude 1. Frequency of second component, 6 hertz, peak amplitude 1 third. Let's first plot that signal in the frequency domain. The plot in the time domain was, I think, the, yeah, it was the red plot in this diagram. You cannot see it very well now, but the red one is the plot of the time of S2 in the time domain. Let's plot it in the frequency domain. And let's try and draw it on the screen. Uh, and we'll see the difference. Uh, what do we do? The frequency, the time domain is the signal magnitude versus the time. Frequency domain is the signal peak amplitude versus frequency. So we have two axes here. Uh, and the first one, 
on this axis we have frequency in hertz hertz so in this axis we have frequency in this axis we have the signal peak amplitude we denote it as s of f you'll see it on the slides that's a bracket and how we plot this, if we consider those two components, F1, the frequency is 2 hertz, the peak amplitude is 1. So we draw an impulse or a spike at that frequency and with that height. Uh, so let's say here, with the particular amplitude and what have we got? The frequency was 2 hertz, so this is at point 2. And the peak amplitude was 1, at this point. And then at, say, 6 hertz, here, we have a, a spike or an impulse which is 1 third. It's almost straight and uh, amplitude here is one-third. There's our signal. This is a plot of the same signal but from the frequency domain's perspective. Compare that, and I know it's hard to see, uh, but the red one in here, where this is the plot of the same signal in the time domain, we see the red one goes up and then down, the, the, the two humps there and so on. Same signal, but just viewed from different perspectives. So, in summary, with the frequency domain, we plot the individual components. We look at their frequencies, 2 and 6 hertz, and we plot an impulse at those frequencies, 2 and 6 hertz, and the height of that impulse is the peak amplitude of that component, 1 and 1 third. It turns out from mathematical, uh, doing mathematical analysis, it's much easier to operate in the frequency domain than to the time domain. The transformation from time to frequency is Fourier, uh, using Fourier analysis, a Fourier transform. We're not going to cover the mathematics of it, just show the basic principle. We'll come back to that plot. Actually, we will stay here. A new term. For any signal, we can define that signal spectrum. The spectrum is the set of frequencies contained in that signal. What are the set of frequencies contained in this signal, S2? What are the frequencies? 2 and 6. Okay, that's all. So we'd say the spectrum of this signal is 2 and 6. And in fact, we see it in the plot very easily. 2 and 6 is the spectrum. Another term is called the absolute bandwidth. The absolute bandwidth of the signal is the width of the spectrum. So our spectrum in this signal is 2 and 6. The bandwidth will be absolute bandwidth of this signal. What's the width? Considering the two frequencies, what's the width of those frequencies? It's 4 hertz. 6 minus 2. So, if we go back to our slides to see the definitions, some new concepts. Spectrum of a signal is the range of frequencies that signal contains. Our example contains two frequencies, four and, uh, 2 and 6 hertz. The absolute bandwidth is the width of that spectrum from the minimum frequency component up to the maximum frequency component. In this case, from 2 up to 6, therefore we say the bandwidth, or to be precise, we'll see there's another definition later, the absolute bandwidth is 4 hertz for this signal.
Again, hard to see, but we had a green signal. Which was the same as the red one, plus one-fifth sine 2 pi times 5 times 2 t, which is 20 pi t. The red signal, sine 4 pi t plus a third sine 12 pi t, the green one when I plotted it, was sine 4 pi t plus one-third sine 12 pi t plus one-fifth sine 20 pi t. The green one had three components. It's again difficult to see, but we see the, the oscillations there. Try and plot the green signal in the frequency domain. That is, try and modify this plot or, or write a new, create a new plot that shows the green signal in the frequency domain. What do I do? On the screen is the blue, oh, sorry, the red signal in the, what we call the red signal in the frequency domain, which had two components. The green signal has three components, the first two plus another one. What would you do on this plot? Anyone? Try and plot it. Common exam question. Here's an equation for a signal. Draw that signal in the frequency domain. What would you do? What's going to be different? You need to remember the definition or, or how we create this plot in the frequency domain. We have impulses or spikes in the plot at each frequency component. So we had an impulse at 2 hertz and at 6 hertz. And the height of those impulses was the peak amplitude, 1 third and 1. So with our new signal, the green one, there are now three components. The first two are the same as the previous one. So they have a frequency of 2 hertz, amplitude of 1, frequency of 6 hertz, amplitude of 1 third, and the third component has a frequency of 10 hertz and an amplitude of one fifth. So a plot of the th that would we'd have to extend here and draw at 10 hertz. My scale's not going to work very well, but I think you'll get the idea. Of course, the scale's not quite here, but if this was 10 hertz. Uh, if this was at the point of 10 hertz and the height here is one fifth. So excuse the scale on my plot, you can do it better. This would be a plot of our signal which has three components. Plotted in the frequency domain. In the time domain, and again hard to see, it's the green one here. Same signal, just different perspectives. Considering this new, the green signal we call it, what is its spectrum? What is the spectrum of the one on the screen? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the spectrum is uh, the, the set of frequencies, so it's a set of frequency values. There's, there'll be three values in that set. We can say the spectrum is 2, 6 and 10 hertz. So it's a set of frequency values. What is the absolute bandwidth of this signal? 8 hertz. 
I think someone said it. If not, the bandwidth. Think of just the width from the maximum frequency component, 10, down to the minimum, 2. The bandwidth then is 8 hertz. Okay. So, and we'll see that bandwidth becomes important because it will impact on other parameters. This, this signal, what we call the green one, has three components. It has a bandwidth of 8 hertz. The previous signal, the red one, had two components and a bandwidth of 4 hertz, half the bandwidth. What we're going to see is that, in general, a signal that occupies a larger bandwidth can give us a higher data rate, more bits per second. But a signal that occupies, occupies a larger bandwidth costs more. So the financial cost eventually becomes more because of different factors. So which signal do we use? The one with two components or three components? Well, it becomes to be different trade-offs. One with three components produces, has a larger bandwidth. We'll, it will give us a higher data rate, in theory, but it will incur a higher cost. And the other factor is accuracy of the data received. What if we add a fourth component using one-seventh sine, what have we got, uh, 28 pi t? If we add a fourth component, the fourth component would be a frequency of 14 hertz. So the bandwidth would range from 2 up to 14 hertz, a bandwidth of 12 hertz. If we add a fifth component, the bandwidth gets larger. And if we keep adding components, the bandwidth gets more and more. The higher the bandwidth, the higher the cost involved with that signal. So we want to minimize the bandwidth. If we keep adding components forever, we get, a, in fact, in theory, an infinite bandwidth, and we get the square wave. It's the perfect signal in terms of errors, but the bandwidth is extremely high. Okay? So there are some trade-offs, in fact three main trade-offs. That choose a signal which, so design a signal which gives a high data rate, uh, is cheap, is generally low bandwidth, less complexity, and can tolerate errors, that is accurate. So we'd say a square wave is more accurate than the sine wave. So there's no one answer as to what is the best signal. Those trade-offs need to be considered when people design signals. What have we missed? So go back and see what we've skipped over. OK, we look at signals. We can look in the time domain or frequency domain. Time domain is a function of time, like our normal plots. Communication signals are made up of sine, sine waves, sinusoids. So we combine them together to get a resulting communication signal. Uh, the examples we've given are very simple. They're not realistic, but they show how that we can combine sine waves to get other signals. But the way that we combine them and the number of components impacts upon uh, the bandwidth of the signal, where the bandwidth is the uh, maximum frequency component minus the minimum component. We want to minimize the bandwidth to reduce the cost, but it turns out generally we want to increase the bandwidth to increase the data rate. So there's a trade-off there. I chose this pattern of one third, three FT, one fifth, five FT, and so on to get a particular shaped output. We don't have to have this pattern, but it's common. Uh, so this is an example of adding two components to get a resulting signal. And this is an example of that same signal, the, the bottom one but plotted in the frequency domain, where there are two components, 
and it shows the frequencies they're at and the peak amplitude of each component. Real signals are more complex than the ones we've looked at and we may see a, in general, a frequency plot like this. There are an infinite number of components. So we get, a, instead of impulses, we get a continuous curve here. So it's more complex than the simple ones we've looked at. And we've defined the spectrum of a signal is the set of frequencies. The bandwidth, or the absolute bandwidth, is the, uh, the range, or the width, of the spectrum. Uh, the DC component we're not going to deal with in this course. And this summarizes what I plotted with those colored plots on the screen, that by adding more components, the top one has got two components, the bottom one and three components, and we see the shape getting closer to a square wave. A square wave is more accurate than the ones shown on the screen in that there's less chance of errors, which is desirable. By adding four components, which is the one on the top, by adding an infinite number of components, in theory, we get a perfect square wave. So by having more components, we get a more accurate signal, but it turns out the bandwidth gets larger and the cost gets larger. Let's stop there for today. What we'll do uh, next week in is go through an example that shows again this relationship between bandwidth, the number of components, data rate, and cost. Okay, we'll go through an example and then move on.